This morning, we're going to be doing two sections as usual. And the first is going to be a take on the graces of spiritual exercises. They are distinct to the spiritual exercises that are Ignatian, but they are not privy to that. What I'm going to speak to about those graces are going to be also open to anybody, even though the exercises focus in and give you an exposure to this, a lot of people can pick these things up in other ways. Okay, so if you look at your outlines that you have in your hands, I'm going to be using that graces one first. Okay, and then after, I'm going to ask too maybe if David would do a timekeeping and give me kind of a signal when I've got five minutes left so I can rush through the last part if I have to. Okay, so uh, I'm going to be following these frames, so that'll help you. If it helps you to look up here, fine. If you don't want to look at this, fine. Look at what's in your hand. You know, we learn different ways. So whatever suits you and helps you to learn is why you're here today. I want to ask a blessing to begin and then we're going to start. So a moment of quiet. Most Holy One, we bring you today all the pain, all the struggle, even all the corruption that we humans are always involved in. For you seem not to notice. You seem to keep telling us we're going to be new. Because your son is new. You keep telling us we are yours. And you don't intend to lose us. Because you're a good shepherd. Please fill us with your spirit as we listen today as we hear each other talk about your wonders, the wonders you work in our lives from the time we have a cup of coffee or tea in the morning to the time when we fall asleep at night. You never give up. You use our human stuff and through that you keep giving us kisses. In your gracious mercy, may your spirit fill us with joy in this resurrection time and fill us with hope. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, on the first little slide there, what you have really is that I'm, I'm kind of zeroing in on two main graces. First of all, heightened awareness. In the exercises, you begin to notice yourself in your reaction to things, especially when you use your imagination as you pray. You begin to notice your emotions. You begin to notice how you react. So one of the graces is a very heightened awareness of your own operations, your own human functioning. The second, really, in that little first, is, is really what I want to zero in on today, which is something most of us uh, are not that aware of, and that's bias. Now, the reason I'm going there is because we're in a voting year. We're in a very politically charged atmosphere. We're watching a trial go on. We're watching certain people, you know, on, on the screen over and over again. We're hearing criticism here, criticism there. And we just eventually turn it off. Lots of us just have decided to turn it off because it's so convoluted and it is so confusing that I don't know where to go with it. I want to deal with that. 
because we can't afford to abdicate. We can't afford to jump ship. So we've got to be able to deal with bias. And the exercises are, are geared to help us to recognize bias in ourselves and then to recognize it in anybody on that TV screen. We can put our finger to the wind and say, I think I know what's going on here. That's what you need. You need to be able to identify bias when you hear it. So we're going to be talking about that as it, clear, as it clarifies the consciousness so that you can spot it. What is the source of this? The source of this is a Jesuit named Bernard Lonergan. He is the master of bias. And most people think just, you know, that he's not able to be understood. Well, you're going to understand what he's talking about today, hopefully, or I haven't done my job. Okay. Now, you're going to uh, see a strange diagram on your paper. Let's look at that. It looks like ellipses overlapping one another. It's a gray kind of diagram. I want you to look at the arrow at the top if you would. Okay, yeah. The arrow at the top is going this way and this way. At one end of the arrow it says limitation and at the other end of the arrow itself it says self-transcendence or more, 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 more. Openness, openness, openness. Now we all experience that arrow tension because our physicality is going to tell you no my rheumatism is acting up or my arthritis today and I'm not going to do that hike with my grandchildren so you're limited your physicality is limitation and boundary you deal with it all the time I have to get in the car and then I have to go to schnooks I have to go to Deerberg's, you know, and it's going to take me mm, 20 minutes. So I better leave at. So you're always dealing with time limitation. We're all familiar with this stuff. The other end of the diagram is self-transcendence. That's your prayer. That's when you reach for the sky. That's when you say, there's got to be more to life than this. That's self-transcendence. That is that call that you are made for something more. That you cannot be petty. You cannot be unforgiving. You cannot be narcissistic. Narcissism is an ego form by which you, me, myself, and I are the three most important people in the world. We all know people who, who give evidence of narcissism or egotism. We're going to hear more about that today because that's one of the awarenesses that come from the exercises. Now, if you look at those circles or ellipses, they're not really supposed to be separate. They're supposed to be squished together in a unity. Now, if that happens, you've got like layers of the person the depth layer of the person is physicality. And in that, you have to understand those are all your functions. You can take them off. Respiratory, my lymphatic system, my digestive system, you can name them. When, you're, when there's something with them and there's something wrong with them, where do you go? The doctor, okay? That's the area of physicality what we call the organism. That's our house. That's what we live in during our time-space, our time-space journey, which for most of us is around 100 years or a little less. The middle part I want to leave till last because that's where I'm going to focus. The, the greatest part is called spiritual, the human spirit. And most people, if they, you ask them 
what are those functions, they wouldn't know a ghost of a notion of what to say to you. Well, that's when I pray. Your spiritual functions are your human intelligence and your human choice or choosing volition. We call it the will. But it's a function and it's, it's active. It's not just a noun. No. You have operations that are intellectual. You have operations that are volitional. And advertising is trying to entice them all the time. Because if you see the ad the tenth time, you might go out and buy it. Okay? You can watch that on, on your advertising and marketing. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Get them hooked, get them hooked, get them hooked. So they go out and buy more and more and, well, you know the story. All right. That's working on your will. The intelligence is when we don't understand stuff and shoot our mouths off anyway. The spiritual function of intelligence is very mismanaged through misinformation, through downright lying, through downright false information. If you don't, that's spiritual activity. I'm sorry, no puppy dog can do it. All right, so we have to understand that our functions physically and spiritually are, we, you know, we either are being in the driver's seat and somebody else is at the wheel or we're at the wheel of our little car. And that's what we're going to look at today. Now the interesting part that is even more mysterious than, than those two main dimensions of our humanness because they account for body, they account for soul, is the middle overlap part that glues them together. It's called our psychic energy. It's a psychic energy field. And these are not things. They're dimensions of humanness that function together to make you a whole person. And there can be sickness in any three of them. Physical sickness is we're most familiar with. Spiritual sickness is when you are, you are ignorant and you live out of ignorance and you feed that to everybody else and you are immoral. That's spiritual sickness. But we don't know about that middle area. That middle area is your psychic area. It's your subconscious. And in your subconscious, there's all sorts of stuff buried from when you were little that you don't want to remember. So you revert, you revert it back into the subconscious. And it stays unaware. You're not thinking about it. But it shoots at you from down below the bushes of your subconscious. So for example, let me give you an example of, say, a young woman who was violated by her uncle as a child, and she gets married. And on the night of her wedding, she doesn't know why she's so tense. And her bridegroom is concerned because he doesn't understand why she's so tense. The abuse from her uncle is operating from the subconscious in that young girl. <coughs> she's not thinking about it, but it's a wound. And that memory is making her psycho-spiritually tense. Now, we could repeat this over and over again with every type of abuse the little kid in kindergarten who is told by the teacher, you're so stupid, you will never amount to anything. And how that little tape is playing in the back of his head and in his subconscious. And you can maybe think of things that were said to you, or you can think of things that were done to you. They are not gone. In some sense, they're in your feeling memory. 
in that subconscious. Now you'll notice there are some words there. Uh, you've got uh, imaging, uh, instinct, emotion. We can't go into that today. That's a fascinating part of the human being. But we are going to look at those emotions down below because the emotions all operate through that psychic area. The, the joiner area influences the physical. That's why sometimes when you're tense or going through a very horrendous situation, you will have digestive problems or you, will, you can't sleep or then uh, you, you don't know how to pray. Because what is working from within that subconscious area is going to influence your physicality, it's going to influence your spiritual functioning. We are one unit, and these dimensions are unified. But we, to understand them, we can learn a little bit of what's going on with us. So, okay, let's move to the next frame. But keep that frame in mind, because I'm going to be referring back to it. When we're talking heightened discernment and the graces of discernment, there are three then. They're physical, because there's, uh, you're, you are a being affirmed in your physicality. Now, we're having challenges with this, because we have people who have uh, gender differentiation today. And so the church is trying to deal with how we affirm these people and to, to catch up on the science of how their physicality is the way it is. We're in that struggle. So don't jump on any bandwagons. Be ready to listen to truth as it's coming from science and the work in the spiritual area. Don't make judgments yet when you don't have enough data okay so the psychological area is being tuned to imagination and emotion much more through the discernment that comes through the exercises you learn in your prayer that you should pay attention to your imagination you should ask the questions that come from the visualization of the Gospels when you pray. So, and third, spiritually, this is a very key element and I think it has to do with not hearing or experiencing the answer to our prayer. The spiritual element in our day, we are very much challenged to respect God's sovereignty the king, under the banner of the king in the exercises. Why? Well, for heaven's sake, I've prayed for three years that something happened with this and nothing happens. What's the matter with you? You can't run the universe properly. You should let me run it. <laughs> That's questioning God's sovereignty. Or, I pray it every day. I ask God for this every single day. I guess he's deaf. Now, if that stuff hasn't gone through your head, I want to touch you. Right? <laughs> what do you do with that? What do you do with it is you bow your head and you say, you are Lord. You know what you're doing, I don't, and I thank you. I thank you for whatever you are doing to answer my prayer. You don't keep repeating the prayer as if God is deaf. He heard you the first time. When that problem, when that person comes to your mind again, stop dead in your tracks and say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't know what you're doing with him. I don't know what you're doing with Gaza. I don't know what you're doing with the Sudan. I don't know what you're doing with Haiti. I don't know what you're doing. But I thank you. 
I thank you for whatever you're doing, that I know nothing. That's sovereignty. And you're not it. That's very difficult because the hangover from the primal sin in us is egoism and arrogance. We always want to understand it all. We always want to be in control of it all. And we want to make sure that we've been, that we've been part of it. Be careful of whenever that cobra sticks its head out of its basket. It wants to bite you. It's arrogance. It's pomposity. It's control. And it's pure pride. And it's the hangover from the primal sin which got us in trouble in the first place. Next slide. What am I talking about when I'm talking about bias? It's not sin. It's a hangover from sin. It's like when you've been drunk and you wake up with a headache the next morning. It's a hangover. It's what others influence you. How they influence you. And how your own formation and your own youth, your own childhood, is still kind of in a in a kind of a, 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 a more or less incorrect mode. And you've learned how you have to move from one point of view to another. Because what you thought was correct from when you were 12 is now obsolete because now you're 30 or 60 or 80, all right? Bias isn't sin, but it's the effects of sin on us a type of woundedness. Do not blame it. Do not blame it, okay? The root is our self-centered narcissism, and when we talk bias, there are four. Next slide. The first you'll recognize very easily, it's called individual egoism. My way or the highway. Oh no, oh no, I'm not going to listen to that. I've got my mind made up. No. Very familiar. Second, group egoism. Our way is best. Our religion is best. Nobody is going to heaven except us. And uh, our race is best, you know. Our view of gender is best, you know, because it's binary. It's just two. There are no other possibilities. Really? Group egoism. Every ism you can think of. Narcissism, sexism, racism, nationalism, fascism. You can put ism, so don't ever use the word Catholicism. <laughs> so I'm just fussy. I'm a theologian and I, I'm careful with words. Any ism word is pejorative of that thing. Talk about Catholicity. And I'd tell McBrien that too, even though he titled his book Catholicism. Catholicity is an identity term. Catholicism is a pejorative sense of that reality. You don't want to be talking about Catholicism if you understand grammar. Next point. Um, when, you, when you're dealing with group egoism, you're dealing with a form of the individual bias gone corporate. For the third one is general, very easy. It's anti-intellectual. I just don't want to hear about that because then I might have to change my mind. I don't want to learn about that. No, no. You say I have diabetes and I should do certain things. I just don't want to hear about it. Just give me a pill. I don't want to do anything about my diet or my exercise. No, no. I just give me a give me a fast fix, okay? That's general bias. I don't want to be informed. I don't want to learn. You see where it becomes dark on the spiritual side. And finally, the last one, which is dramatic. 
Dramatic is what happened to the young girl. Dramatic bias is when you are abused in some way, disrespected in some way, put down in some way. It lingers in your feeling memory and you feel uncomfortable when you're with those people. Or you're not going to sit next to her. Or you're not going to be with him. You don't know why you're uncomfortable. You don't remember anything. You know why? Because it's in your subconscious. That's why. It's called dramatic bias because it comes from the drama of, this, of the life. It's from your life experience, from your own soap opera. Dramatic bias, then, is, is what uh, cripples us. And so, where is it? It's in that diagram operating from that psychic center. It'll influence you physically and it'll influence you spiritually. And what can you do about it? Our next slide. Be very careful when you discover it in yourself or you notice it in another. Use the, Jesu the Jesuit a little, little ditty. If you haven't learned the little Jesuit ditty, you gotta learn the little ditty. Name it, claim it, it's mine, or hers, or his. Name it, claim it, don't blame it. You're wounded. You don't kick at a wound. Name it, claim it, don't blame it, and tame it. Tame it is you look at it and you say, no, I ain't going there. I'm not feeding that. So you go Ajara Contra. That's the expression in the exercises. You go the opposite. Ajara Contra. It's a Latin phrase. You don't have to worry about the Latin. It means go against it. Go the opposite of it. So when that wound is hurting and screaming, and you're, finally you say, oh, oh, that's my memory coming back. No, I'm not going to let it rule me. No, the more you bring it up into consciousness, the more you can say, my dearest Lord, touch me. Touch me. Because all he does is touch. And the person is healed. Think he can't do that with you? And that takes us to our next section, but we need a break. In the second topic for today, which is contemplatives in action, you probably said, oh, that's pie in the sky. I'm a very practical person. I'm not going to even worry about that one. Well, let me, let me try and change your mind. All right? Contem contemplation is very often looked upon as for contemplatives in a monastery where they are somehow in la-la land and they are not in touch with the fact that their stuff is left in the laundry and the next person has to put their wash in. That's not any, it's further from the truth than that. It's not, that's not what we're talking about here. The basis of contemplation is wonder. The child is a born contemplative. Look at that anthill. Grandma, where do they go? There are hundreds of them. Grandma, where do they go? Where are they going with all that stuff they're carrying, Grandma? <coughs> and all you say is, don't, Tommy, you don't step on them now. Because otherwise, they're not going to have a daddy or mama. When they get home, their daddy and mama's going to be gone because you stepped on them. So you teach them compassion by looking at an anthill. And the child is fascinated. The child is fascinated with the butterfly. The child's fascinated with the squirrel. The child's fascinated with the puppy. The child's fascinated with you. 
Think of the last time you wondered at something. Was it the little hand or the little foot of your newborn grandchild when those little fingers and those little toes looked at you and you looked at them and you thought, my God, how did they get made like that? Any time we're caught in amazement, we're using our contemplative capacity. No puppy, no kangaroo, or no gerbil can do that. Wonder comes from connection to transcendence. That end of the spectrum. I stand with my mouth open. I don't know what to say. That's wonder. That's your contemplative base. You all have it. Now the question is, how do you develop it? So it doesn't shrivel up and become some side thing. That's why you have to learn about the dance. Okay, you've got to learn how to dance. Come on, get off of that chair. You've got to learn how to dance. All right. Wonder and awe is the base, and it takes two, it says on the screen. It takes two on the next screen. All right. And I'm going to teach you how to start. You're sitting there on the sideline, and you're a wallflower, and you're not going to get on the dance floor. No. You embarrass yourself. You know, I'm not going to know how to dance. I don't know how to dance. And then he comes and he looks at you. That's all. Teresa of Avila is the mistress of the gaze. If you want to read about this, you read Teresa of Avila. She'll teach you the prayer of the gaze. You sit down. Maybe you want to shut your eyes because you're a coward like me. And there he is. He said he will be with you until the end of the age. Well, where is he? You say in the tabernacle. Oh, come now. The tabernacle in the center of the church is the reminder that you are the tabernacle and he is in the center of the tabernacle. So he's in the depths of your very being, morning, noon, and night, even while you're sleeping. And you are out to lunch. Meister Eckert says that. Meister Eckert says, God said to me, Eckert, I'm always at home. It is you who are out to lunch. Contemplative prayer, contem contemplation, is the capacity to learn about presence. And it's not Christmas presence. It's the God presence. Why? Because of our, because of our bias, because of our clouded psyche, because of our woundedness, we have amnesia. We are amnesiacs. We have amnesia. We forget and live most of our life in forgetfulness because we're wounded. Contemplative prayer and the gaze helps us to heal. So contemplative prayer begins by sitting down, putting your book aside, putting your scriptures aside, putting your rosary aside, and just letting him look at you. Drink to me only with thine eyes and I will pledge thee mine. To endure, to endure being looked at is very hard for us. 
especially being looked at with laughter and love. We don't feel very lovable and we don't want to laugh. And he looks at us and we don't know what to go, what to do and what to we, we, we get out my we get out my prayer book. And I get my prayer book, I'm gonna read my scriptures. No, 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 dear. No, no, no. Three minutes every day. Time yourself. Three minutes. Receive. Do nothing. Receive that love. Let him fill you with it till you're just bursting. Let him fill you with light until you become more and more transparent from within. Just let him do his work and stop sticking your fingers in it and messing it up. Let the bridegroom look at you. Next slide. What happens with this practice, says Therese, to her little newbies, her new sisters, who are, she said, you must be careful, dear, because while you're sitting there, all the crud that's buried in your psyche, all the woundedness is all going to come up. Like after a storm on a lake, when all that black stuff comes up, you are to let it float right down the river. Let it float by. Don't pay any attention to it, dear. Because his love is going to clean out your psyche. Let him do his work. Let him deal with your memories. Just let it go, dears. Do not be distracted by looking at and say, oh, I remember when that happened, and then you're deep into the memory and you're crying, and that's, uh, no, 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 no. Let it go by, just let it go by. The, the time, she said, will be about six months. You do this regularly, about six months and you will develop a contemplative consciousness. Why? Because you're down at, you're down at Deerberg's or at Schnook's or at Aldi's and you're walking with that, that clothes, that, that food, you know, cart. And you're walking down the aisle and all of a sudden you smile because you're remembering those eyes. And then you go on, you check your stuff out, you get in the car, Mm, you remember those eyes and you smile and you will know that it's like perfume it's like the music is playing and every time your consciousness has a moment of pause very often that will come back to you you will develop a contemplative consciousness because you received where it comes from okay so, God leads always. It is God doing this. You are the receiver. And I'm sorry, gentlemen, you have to learn that here. You're not leading this dance. All right? This is the feminine part of your soul has to respond to this because you have to learn receptivity. That's why we hear so much from the feminine mystics on this, except John of the Cross, who learned it from Teresa. All right? What is going to happen here is that your, your life experience begins to be permeated with that sense of presence. And you'll be doing, folding your laundry and a little smile will come and you'll like wink because you'll feel those eyes. And you'll just go on folding your laundry, but you're going to be... So it, the dance begins. The dance is, I do what I do, he does what he does. I do what I do, he does what he does. And so there is 
uh, a growing sense of presence in the midst of activity. Let me make that clear. The phrase in, in the uh, exercises is contemplation in action. It's not or action, it's in action. That's why it's a dance. It's a dance of what I do, what he does. What I do, what he does. What I do, what he does. Whether you are writing a book, whether you are folding laundry, whether you're trying to talk to a client, whether you're sitting down and getting your taxes done, whether you name it. You name it. It's a part of the dance. And every now and then, you will smile and you will nod or wink. It's just like a checkpoint Charlie. And this grows in the person until there's almost a constant sense of presence. And you are getting healed from your amnesia. All right? That's all there's to it. That's contemplation in action psychologically and spiritually. So there's the rhythm throughout the day, back and forth. There's the form, because music always has to have not just rhythm, but form. And that's going to manifest in your behavior. Because the result of the dance is joy and peace and patience and mildness, and benignity, and long-suffering, and chastity. What are those? Fruits of the Spirit. So your behavior is going to be like lavender in a room. You're going to walk into a room, and somebody is going to just feel at ease, because you're there. You're going to, you're not going to control this. You don't press a button. This is consciousness, human consciousness, as becoming more and more transparent of bias and more and more transparent of, of presence so that you become a living, walking, talking, worded woman or worded man. Now that's a Dominican expression. You become worded. That means you are a message for everyone you meet. You are a good word. You are a word of peace before you open your mouth. You are a person of gentleness, a person of uh, listening, a person of whatever he can do with you. But he's doing it. He, you're not the pizza. You're the pizza delivery girl. But don't forget, you're not the pizza. Or as John Baptist said, I am not the Messiah. No, I'm a voice. I'm the delivery person for the Messiah. He had it straight. So do we have to get it straight. We're the delivery of all of this beauty because we're a human being. And that's a human being in a resurrected, rising state. Every day, a little more cleansed from bias, a little more, I am filled more with a little more light today from his gaze so I can be more for the person I'm going to sit next to as they are dying. I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to put my hand on theirs. I'm just going to be there for them because you're giving presence to presence, and they might be out to lunch, but you're bringing presence to them and to yourself. Okay? That's all. That's it. <laughs> Any comments or questions? Or comments? That, you know, yeah, please. It's a comment. You certainly give us hope. Good. In, a uh, in the catechism that is called the Baltimore Catechism. How many remember that? 
Yeah, yeah, you and I both, all right. You have to remember that we were part of an immigrant community. German, Slovakian, whatever, whatever we come from. We were in a Protestant country. We had to get into our parish before, so that we could belong somewhere because Catholics, Jews, and blacks need not apply. We, we couldn't get jobs, we couldn't be elected, we couldn't... Some of you remember those days, all right? The Baltimore Catechism, ladies and gentlemen, were, was written on one weekend in Baltimore by a Monsignor because the bishops were so frustrated they didn't know what to do with all these immigrant communities to help them learn to keep the, keep the faith so that they weren't secularized by the American culture. So the Monsignor went home and he did all the questions and answers. And he brought it back to the bishops. And the bishops said, oh dear God, and they shelved it. It sat on the shelf. And they got so desperate, they took it off the shelf and they put pictures in it. And then you had Baltimore Catechism number two. You remember? Some of you, Baltimore Catechism was blue and then Baltimore Catechism number two was green. And they sent it out to every pastor. He, bought, he published it and sent, gave it to all his first graders. I'm not kidding, that's the story. We were bought up on that as our, what we understood about our faith. We knew very little about liturgy. We didn't know anything about our Catholic history. We didn't know why the Protestants were arguing with us. We had no idea why it was all that, what happened and how that happened and so on. We never learned that until the 1940s and 50s with Pius XII. And then, thank God, the Catholic Church came back to Scripture because up until 1950, from 1870 to 1950, Catholics couldn't do Scripture. Well, why not? Because the Protestants had heresies going called the Passover plot and all sorts of things about Scripture that was off the wall. And the papacy said, stay out of it. Don't get mixed up in that stuff. And by the 50s, it cleared and the green light came back on. And Catholics could again do scripture after all the smoke cleared. Everybody, all the Protestants made all the mistakes. <laughs> now, more of that, that's for another time. But it gets to the point of the question, and that is uh, hope comes from truth, knowing facts. We, we know, we learned about our sinfulness and about how we were sinners and we learned about the passion of Jesus. It wasn't until 1950 or 1960 that we began to even look at the resurrection. You try and find a question about the resurrection in the Baltimore Catechism. It isn't there. Because we were suffering so much as a community, all we <coughs> looked at was atonement. And all we looked at was that. That's what we were brought up on, folks. And by the 50s, we were told we're now to get into Bible groups and study scripture. And now we're talking about the fact that the mystery of Jesus has two parts. The first part is they beat him to death. And they're trying to do that to us too. Listen to the news. That's one part. But then you hear things like the five Muslim doctors here in St. Louis, who every weekend, the Muslim doctors, yes, who teach at St. Louis U Hospital, and every, every weekend they have five free clinics for people who don't have insurance. Have you heard about that? Well, lots of people haven't. All that stuff is resurrection stuff 
of human beings going contra to what they're told, you're just, you're just disposable. You're just disposable. Anybody who acts contra to that is in the soul of the church. They're not baptized. They're not in this body. But it's in, they're in the soul of the church because they're in the Holy Spirit. So now we're looking at different religions differently and we're saying, my goodness, they're not all going to hell. <laughs> well, we didn't believe that in the first place because we had wonderful neighbors who were Jewish and wonderful neighbors who were, you know, God knows what. And they were kinder than our Catholic neighbors. Well, what's God going to do with that? That's intelligence. That's when, you're, when your spiritual part of your being is getting rid of bias and you're going to find out about this stuff even though it takes a little time and you're going to have to not watch as much television. So that's a big long answer to a short question. We are people of hope because we know that through the suffering there's something after Holy Saturday. Can you imagine that those apostles, the mood they were in, and the mother of Jesus? Think about, meditate on it. They were in the pits. Did they know about Sunday? Oh, no. They heard him. They heard all this. They had, didn't I know what he was talking about. Well, they found out. God is like a magician. And he can pull a rabbit out of a hat. Well, what rabbit is he going to pull out of Gaza? That's another crucifixion. What is he going to pull out of Sudan? What is he going to pull out of Haiti? Where's the rabbit? That's the Christian question. Lord, Lord, my prayer is before you. I thank you for whatever you're doing, which I do not understand. We are people of hope. Don't be any less. Any other comments, questions? You carry a light. Don't let it go out. As long as you're standing in a stadium and you have one match, the darkness hasn't won. Be it. Be it. That's your role. That's who you are. Okay? Okay. Woo. Thank you. Thank you.